Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, I recognize the young lady from New York, Ms. Rice, for five thank minutes. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Acting Secretary, for being here today. We saw an unprecedented attack on our democracy from a foreign adversary in 2016. DHS is responsible for securing our critical infrastructure, including our elections. Do you agree with the intelligence community's 2017 assessment that Russia interfered in our presidential election to help then-candidate Donald Trump? I accept the conclusions of our experts in the intelligence community. Thank you. Has President Trump ever discussed the possibility of blocking entry into the U.S. southern border with you? So, first of all, I'm, I'm not going to comment on conversations I've had or not had with the President of the United States. I think he's pretty clear on record about his priority for uh, securing the southern border and the initiatives he's undertaking to do that, very publicly stating them, Oval Office addresses, and so forth. Mr. McAleenan, the President said it to the American people that he is going, thinking about shutting down the southern border. Did he ever directly speak with you about that? He spoke directly to the American people. I'm sure you can answer that question. He did speak to the American people about it, and right. he also updated the American people that he was not looking at that as an immediate option, uh, that so did he we're speak trying to with collaborate with Mexico to address a shared challenge from transnational criminal organizations. Did he uh, speak to you about it? I'm not going to talk about conversations with the president. Did he ever mention the possibility of a pardon if you violated the law and were arrested for closing the southern border, yes or no? As I've noted, I'm not going to You're talk about conversations with the president, but I've never been asked to do anything illegal, and I've, I'm on record in the media and elsewhere with that answer. Well, have any people who have worked for you addressed concerns about being asked to do things that they felt were not legal and the personal ramifications they might suffer as a result of that? Have any, has that ever bubbled up to your level? So we would not ask our law enforcement professionals to violate the law. That, that's not uh, acceptable for, for my level or for any of our leaders. So Mr. Um, Langevin asked you about CISA and your department's request for volunteers from different agencies throughout the federal government. Um, CISA actually was not the only agency at DHS, uh, that, that, that DHS or at DHS that you directed to ask for volunteers. Um, are you, do you know the number of employees from TSA that have volunteered to go to the southern border? I, I don't have that in front of me. I know that TSA has been one of our most responsive agencies in helping with crises or natural disasters uh, for years. Uh, when, there are some TSA peop, employees who have volunteered? Yes, certainly. Right? Okay. And how many of them, or have they been trained to work with migrant children and families? So there will be training for anyone who's engaging directly with migrants Has there on been arrival. for volunteers who are already there? So any, any volunteer who's been deployed and is already on the border supporting CBP that will have received an orientation and training upon arrival. So the training is going on? Yes. How many employees from the U.S. Secret Service have volunteered to go to the southern border? I don't have that information as I sit here, but I can get it back to you. Have any of them been trained to work with migrant children and families? Again, that process would happen on arrival with a specific assignment in a sector, uh, depending on the skills and expertise of the person going. It could be an attorney. We're not going to necessarily need to train them for, for migrant interaction. It could be a commercial driver's license holder okay. that's so going to just simply be driving. Yeah, no, no, I'm aware. So, um, former Secretary Nielsen declared that cyber attacks now exceed the risk of physical attacks, and the Mueller report made clear the lengths the Russian government will go to meddle in our elections. So, CISA, obviously, um, being the agency responsible for the cybersecurity of 99 federal agencies, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me that this is not an ideal use of their time, even if it's on a voluntary basis. So, again, if for, for critical personnel that are directly involved in protecting the election infrastructure, I do not expect them to be deployed as but volunteers. You're not, you context. don't control who volunteers. If the general call is put out for volunteers, anyone can volunteer, right? Respectfully, at, at the cabinet level, we don't do individual selections of whether volunteers can go. That's yeah, my you expectation should be aware that our, our what, managers you are, should be are going aware to handle that with appropriate assessment of You the should risk. be aware of what your agency is asking people to do. Because they have critical functions that they have to do in their own job description. And you've been given a lot of money from Congress to increase hiring and get people on board so you don't, we don't have to deplete critical agencies at a 
critical time. Yeah, we, we do you agree with President Trump's decision? Mission, do, you, do you agree with President Trump's decision to cut off aid to Central America at this critical juncture? So I'm on record in multiple venues talking about the fact that to address this crisis effectively, we're going to need to increase security, governance, and address the push factors in Central America. So what my responsibility is, and I think what the president's looking for, is our accountable partners in Central America and targeted aid programs that can make a difference, that have a return on investment. Uh, and so working with the Department of State, when we see those opportunities, I will be uh, presenting those uh, through my chain of command. So you, you, are, you mentioned that over the, you're traveling over the weekend? I'm going on Monday, yes. Okay, so, um, and I think the purpose of your trip is to discuss border security efforts. Uh, I'm meeting with ministers from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador in Guatemala City uh, to talk about collaborations on addressing human trafficking and smuggling, yes. Right, and how has that become more challenging with the president's directive to have, I believe, $500 million in aid cut off? Well, it, it's frozen. It's not cut off. It, it's frozen. There are existing programs already ongoing. There are capabilities that these governments have, and there are partnerships on the ground that are ongoing. Uh, again, the attorney general was just there uh, last week focusing on the anti-gang anti partnership that we have with these uh, governments. So I'll be talking about ways that we can continue that momentum and the support we need, both from our capacity building, our professionals doing training, uh, and any programs that, that are critical in that effort. It's, just not, uh, it's not just anti-gang. I mean, obviously, if there are very difficult situations in these countries, that sure. is the number one reason why people are coming here. And so... This is an economic migration. It's an opportunity gap uh, in large part. Okay, uh, so I would just encourage you to continue to be vocal about how important it is that we continue our foreign aid to these countries so that we can begin to, you know, address this crisis that we all agree is happening at the border. And I thank you for your service. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Jones. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from New York. Ms. Rice for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McLean and I too want to uh, join my colleagues in thanking you for your service and wish you luck on uh, your future endeavors. There have been several reports that President Trump is considering appointing acting USCIS Director Ken Cuccinelli or acting CBP Commissioner Mark Morgan, even though the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel has determined that they are ineligible under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act. Are you aware of that? So I'm not going to discuss any pre-decisional personnel uh, efforts, but I will note that the administration will follow the law in naming a successor for the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. In your final hours as acting secretary, do you have any plans to change the current line of succession at DHS? Again, I'm, I'm not going to discuss any pre-decisional personnel actions. Well, I'm just asking if you are planning on doing that. I mean, there's only 24 hours left. I, just... I have no present plans to do that. Have you discussed nominating someone to be the Assistant Secretary of the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office with the President? I have not. Have you spoken to anyone in the administration about that? Again, I'm not going to discuss pre-decisional personnel matters. Well, you just said, I, I was just asking you to, con you said you haven't discussed it with the President. Have you discussed that specific thing with anyone in the administration? I'm not going to discuss pre-decisional okay. personnel matters. Last week, Facebook announced that it had removed a network of Russian-backed accounts that posed as local citizens to support President Trump and attack former Vice President Joe Biden. Multiple reports, including the 2017 Intelligence Community Assessment, Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, and a bipartisan report released earlier this month from the Senate Intelligence Committee, have all confirmed that Russia attempted to interfere in the 2016 election and will do so again in 2020. Do you accept that conclusion, Mr. McAleenan? Yes, uh, our, our entities, are, CISA is leading that effort, uh, along with our intelligence and analysis uh, directorate and others are focused on threats posed to our elections, including from Russia. Mr. Ray, do you agree with those conclusions? Uh, we believe that Russia, we assess that Russia continues to have designs on interfering and influencing our electoral system. And have either of you um, spoken with President Trump or anyone in the administration about Russia and what they're do going, planning on doing in the 2020 election? 
Well, uh, we, I've had, along with others, numerous meetings uh, with folks in the White House, including the President, on election security and on the threats they face. Uh, and do they do? Do you conclude that they appreciate Russia's interference in 2016 and the likelihood that they're doing it now to affect the 2020 election? You just yes or no. You don't have to tell me who you spoke to. Just do you have confidence that there are s someone that there's someone in the administration? It, it, that appreciates me, that. Let me say, it, it is crystal clear, I think, to all of us involved in protecting our elections, FBI, and I don't want to speak for the other agencies, but from all my interaction with our partners, it's been the same, crystal clear that this is a top priority that we intend to take very seriously and throw every tool in the toolbox against. Okay, th thank you. So I, I just want to make reference to an article that literally just posted on the New York Times, and I understand some people's feelings about the New York Times, but let's just accept for a fact that what I'm going to talk about is actually fact. Um, Russia has been testing new disinformation tactics in an enormous Facebook campaign in parts of Africa as part of an evolution of its manipulation techniques ahead of the 2020 American presidential election. The campaign underlined how Russia is continuing to aggressively try different disinformation techniques, even as it has come under scrutiny for its online interference methods, by spreading the use of its tactics to a region that is less closely monitored than the United States and Europe. Um, it said that it was highly likely that Russian groups were already using the same model of working, what they did in Africa is actually work with local people so that it wasn't immediately detectable that these were Russian-backed um, accounts. So the, um, the Russian groups have already started using that model of working with locals right here in the United States to post inflammatory messages on Facebook. And by employing those locals, they, the Russians didn't need to set up the fake accounts as they've done in the past or create accounts that originated in Russia, which is making it easier for the, to sidestep being noticed. I mean, this is just an enormous, enormous problem. Um, Director Ray, how, are, were you aware of this, um, using local people, not just in Africa? And it, it, it was disinformation about uh, criti being critical of American, various American and French policies. Um, but they're doing that now in anticipation of the 2020 election. Can you tell me how, what, are you able to address this? Are you finding Facebook and other social media platforms helpful? If you could just expound on that. Uh, sure. So <clears throat> obviously I haven't read the, the article that you mentioned, um, and I have to be a little bit careful about what I can say that, that I know through other uh, sources, but I'm generally aware of the phenomenon or the tactic, if you will, that you're describing. Uh, I would say that we are uh, expect that the Russians will uh, and already have continued to up their game from you know what they did in 2016. Of course, we've upped our game too, and in particular, you mentioned Facebook. Uh, we've worked very closely with a lot of the social media companies. That's one of the big. Uh, steps forward that happened in the midterms and that has continued right on up to this day is a lot of engagement with uh, those companies to uh, underscore to them that they bear that they bear a significant responsibility in this area and there are a lot of things that they can do under their terms of use terms of service that would be harder for anybody in the government to do in a country like ours uh, and so we've made a lot of progress there's a lot more sharing of information back and forth putting and getting synergies from working together. There's still progress to be made, uh, and we're going to need to keep the pressure on because, I think like I said, I think the bar is just going to keep going up, and you've pointed to a good example of that. Um, I, I would like to continue this conversation with you offline, if that would be possible. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, and I hope that we can all agree that this issue of election, election security is not a political issue. I mean, we are talking about saving democracy as we know it, and I, I, I know all of you gentlemen I think I can speak for you in saying that I know and I'm grateful that you appreciate that fact, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Guest, for five minutes.